Hi, good morning, and welcome to the ZP Developer Zone webinar. So we do this webinar every Thursday at 8 a.m. London time, and um, we do it for the benefit, essentially, of our ZP Developer Zone members. Um, so I'll dive straight into it um, today. Um, and I put this slide up every week, but I'll just very quickly. You know, so we do generally have this ZP Developer Zone. It's very interactive. Um, we have sort of real regulars, um, like Abril and um, Haseem and Aftab um, and Hitchum um, and Ali. So we appreciate, you know, the good regulars that we have. Um, and as part of the ZP Developer Zone, we have our um, academy. We have these webinars that we give and we have collaborations. We have jobs and placements. We have the Developer Zone. Um, and we're also planning, I say here summer school, I, keep, I should really be changing this to winter school. So now we're sort of starting to plan um, a winter school as well. So let me um, go forward um, a little bit. Right, so the, the, um, the webinar is really driven by um, people putting questions up into our forum. And then we say, look, you know, if you've got technical questions regarding biosensors or screen printed electrodes or electronics, um, post them. Um, hi, Selleck. Um, I said we say post them um, up into the um, forum and we'll answer them. So this week we had um, four questions. One of them was around the Easy Flex. So I think this will be particularly interesting to um, High Aftab, to Aftab and people like Selsuk, who are really interested in um, sensors to sensors in IoT type applications. So we had um, questions regarding um, measuring glucose in sweat for. Um, essentially an IoT application. We had a question regarding um, biosensors in harsh environments. That's a particularly interesting question. Um, we had some nice comments about the, the, I say here, the summer school, no, the biosensor school. And then also um, some questions about an, an equation that we put up a couple of weeks ago. So I will um, dive into it a little bit. And... Um, so one of the questions we had was um, that came up in the forum was from Ali, and um, he was asking, um, "Can the Easy Flex be used for measuring glucose in sweat?" And I mean, first of all, those kind of obviously the glucose sensor doesn't care that it's in sweat particularly. I mean, sweat is quite a good matrix for electrochemistry. It's wet. That's a good start, um, and it's got you know, some salt in it, so it's got electrolyte in it. So sweat is um, compatible with doing electrochemical measurements. Obviously, the biggest question you have when you're asking, you know, what's the glucose in sweat is, well, sorry, that's the biggest question, is what is the glucose in sweat? Um, I've been obviously playing in this, or working in this area for, you know, sort of 20 years, and I don't think I've ever heard people make definitive statements about what this, what, what the relationship Hi, Hanadi. Um, people make, you know, definitive... St and in fact, Hanadi, who's just online now, might be an interesting person to ask because she does have a lot of um, CGM um, experience. But there's no, for me, when people say, oh, I want to measure glucose in sweat, it's actually quite a tricky question because, you know, clinically, you don't have to argue what, um, you know... Is it clinically relevant to measure glucose in blood? The answer is yes. People have been doing it for more than 40 years um, and then you can ask the question is it clinically relevant to measure glucose in interstitial fluid and the answer would be it's an easy answer to give you say yes you know it's been done for at least 20 years there's three companies doing it abbott medtronic and dexcom now your question is your question is also is very technical and it sort of it doesn't deal with the clinical there's a clinical question here if you measure glucose in um sweat is it clinically relevant and that i think is not proven so in so this 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 particular application has two challenges they want you want first of all have to develop the technology for measuring glucose in sweat and then secondly you have to prove that um it's relevant you know that it was even a, even linked to blood glucose now i know you could actually do glucose measuring in sweat and just call it well for well-being monitoring and don't make any health claims about it. That would probably be the, the smartest thing to do. 
so anyway that was just the first first ramble on um the question was really about you know can we measure glucose in sweat um and the quick answer is we can using the sweat patch um using one of our glucose sensors and using the easy flex and then there was a whole bunch of technical questions around um um really how to calibrate was one of the is the biggest question the question is if i get a current how do i know what glucose it is we have not calibrated our glucose sensors for sweat applications so every time you change the matrix so if you're measuring glucose in blood that's one calibration factor if you're measuring glucose in interstitial fluid that's another calibration factor there we are that's it um i was just reading it i was just reading the the the, cor the correspond the the, the the um hanadi um is just making some comments um about glucose in sweat but um if you so it's really a calibration factor that if you measure glucose in blood we would use one calibration factor if we measure glucose in interstitial fluid that's another calibration factor if we were measuring glucose in sweat we would have to do that work we would literally have to collect sweat and you know would and then create little you know calibration solutions and make a you know essentially use that to calibrate at least the first time so the quick answer is do we have the or oh, quick answer is do we have the calibration factor for a mon for mapping current to sweat this is interesting phil wong i all right phil wong's just asking a question phil quick answer is if you've got a question like that, please um, post it in the developers forum and we'll answer it there. So let's dive in a bit more on this question. And then the other question was, is the battery um, rechargeable? I believe it's not. Um, can you make our own app for the Easy Flex? The answer is yes. So let me dive in a bit. So what this company or what these group really want to do is they probably want to take our sweat patch kit. So we have a kit on our website which allows you to essentially make a sort of sweat collection system. Um, they can make that on top of our glucose sensor. They can plug the glucose sensor into the Easy Flex. Um, now, one of their questions is, can we make our own app? There's a lot of PDFs on that website of, of ours, including like, you know, Bluetooth protocol. So if you've got the Bluetooth protocol, you can essentially communicate with the app, sorry, communicate with the, with the, um, with the bluetooth aerial yourselves so the quick answer is you can make your own app for this that was always our intention now what i've noticed is um depending on the engineering group there are there you know there's many there's many very good engineers out there but there's very few engineers who really understand obviously glucose sensing and so we, you know i'm always we, we're always having to support people groups you know where they're strong in engineering but they're not strong in biosensors um, but the quick answer is we have in, we have developed it so that people can do their own app development. And I'm also going to say it's, it's no secret we're using the LMP nine one thousand um, no, sorry ninety one hundred um, on this um, particular board. Um, and you can you know so there's a whole bunch of information on the TI website about this. Um, and if you can't find the T, if you can't find the TI website. Um, then there's a link here and that will take you to the TI website. So measuring glucose in sweat is doable. Is it clinically relevant? Not being proven. Um, is the battery recyclable? Re sorry, rechargeable? No. Um, can you make your own app? Yes, is the answer. Now, I think we've actually priced all of our products now at this point where it kind of, you know, you're better off buying and trying rather than sitting and worrying i think we made the easy flex board something like 350 euros these days whereas a few months ago it was 2000 euros so we've cons hi philippe so we definitely have considerably dropped um let's say the financial barrier to get into continuous glucose monitoring um also i'm kind of we are also interested in sensors to api as well so this is not something that this is something that i've put up a few times now this is a package that we will at some point in the near future, allow people to just buy it and they'll be able to get the data off the biosensor just using an API. So that's really the future for for Zimmer and Peacock because people like Selsuk and people like Ali have, you know, really made me aware that 
there's a lot of application developers out there. They don't really want to get involved in the biosensors of the Altronics. And so ZP will give them APIs so they can just come in and develop their own applications. Um, this is a good question that came from Selsuk. And he was asking, you know, can I use, um, he's, used, he's interested in doing applications at minus 20 degrees C. Something that struck me is at minus 20 degrees C, if you were going to measure, you know, I'm just joking around here, glucose at minus 20 degrees C. Obviously, that's not going to work because I suspect that the glucose sample itself will be frozen. So electrochemistry does like to be in the liquid phase or in the damp phase. So if you're trying to measure an aqueous sample, it's minus 20 degrees C. I suspect that that sample as well will also be um, quite cold, or quite frozen rather. I'm also thinking a little bit that most or all enzymes will be shut down by minus 20 degrees C as well. You know, a lot of enzymes... Um, have an optimum temperature of maybe 37 degrees Celsius. We have done our own work at Zimmer and Peacock. It's on the website as well, where we cool the glucose sensor down. And clearly the activity just drops as you cool the temperature. So when you go to minus 20 degrees C, if I'm just thinking about the chemistry of it, make sure the sample's not frozen. Um, and then if it's an enzyme-based system, I strongly suspect um, the enzyme will have shut down. Now, the other thing that I'm concerned about with um, working at minus 20 degrees C is um, we're asking about the Altronics. Now, if you have a box like the Anapot, so the Anapot's sitting at room temperature, and you put it in a cool chamber, and you take it to minus 20 degrees C, if you open the box back up, what you're going to find out is that all the PCBs and all the components are covered in ice. Because obviously what's happened is, you know, it depends on the room humidity as well. But, you know, in an environment where there's, you know, a fair amount of humidity, like, you know, 30% humidity in the room, when you cool the box down, the humidity is going to, in the first instance, it's going to condense. So it's going to condense on the PCBs. And then at minus 20 degrees C, it's going to freeze. Um, um, and so my... So if you've got an open box like that, taking it to minus 20 degrees C is not going to be a good idea. And I think that also goes for the sense it's smart as well, because that's similarly fairly open to the environment. Ali's just asking, can we measure other analytes like lactate and pH in the sweat? Ali, I think pH is a good one to go for. Tell your guys, go for pH. That's much easier than trying to do um, an enzyme-based sensor. So, but back to Selsuk's question. So Selsuk. Be careful minus 20 degrees C because the sample might be frozen. Be careful about trying to use enzyme-based sensors at minus 20 because you know that the enzyme might be quite in, um, inactive. Be careful about going to minus 20 degrees with open electronics like this because the, the humidity in the atmosphere will condense and short out the electronics. If I was going to do what you were going to do, I would be packaging my electronics more like this, because in this package, what we've done is we've taken the PCB and we've eventually and completely encapsulated it. So the PCB is essentially not sitting in air, which contains humidity, it's just sitting within a polymer. So if you're gonna to go to minus 20 degrees C um, with the electronics, I get a single board electronics like we have and completely encapsulate it so that there's no air. Now the other problem I've got is, is the capacitors. I've got a, um, sneaky suspicion that the component that's most likely to fail is capacitors especially uh, so we've never tested our electronics down to here so the quick uh, quickest answer is it has to be tried I would be concerned about the capacitors because sometimes they've got gel electrolytes in them and obviously the gels can freeze up so I even if you can exclude the air you still have to test it because it's the little components like the capacitors I'd be worried about I know one thing that capacitors, if you take them like to 50 degrees C, they will stop working and they'll, or they'll dry out quite quickly. So um, I think that's a fairly thorough answer. Be careful of minus 20 degrees C because of the sample freezing. The enzymes will shut down. Be careful with open electronics because the atmosphere will condense in them. And even if you exclude the atmosphere, you still have to just try it. Um, because I think it's the capacitors that are the weakest um, part. Just to say, we don't, um, we do have these chambers. I think this chamber kind of probably goes 
um, minus 20 to like 100 degrees C. So we um, are quite capable of doing that kind of um, work quite readily. Um, yeah, so Celsuc was asking, I was thinking about an application, let's say for ion detection in rivers. Celsuc, ion detection in rivers, I think is fairly straightforward. I know you know this, but I'll say it just very quickly. Anodic stripping voltammetry. Easy, easy test. Um, so, Celsuc, if you're interested in doing um, ion detection in water, then I, I think anodic stripping voltammetry would be my, um, would be my suggestion. Right, so I will go on a bit. I really appreciated that. I said, look, you know, I'm thinking about, or well, not thinking, I'd, we'd like to do some sort of um, biosensor school in 2022. And I asked a bunch of questions and the guys really came through. Hitcham said, look, you know, three to seven days. I must admit, I do prefer three days. Seven days feels exhausting. I'm losing my voice now. So imagine how it's going to feel after seven days. Um, he does say December or January. I tell you what, these are good thoughts because I was thinking when you said that, I was thinking, all right, December. The reason I think in December was, I know December is a short month because, you know, in Europe and the US, lots of people go on Christmas break. I think January, some of you could probably correct me, can be a bit of a disaster because of the Chinese New Year. So there's never a good time, let's say, but I'm thinking early December is what I'm thinking a little bit. But I appreciate the comments because it's making me think this through a bit more. If you want to, if you want to be lazy in life, Ask your friends, don't ask, your, you know, ask them questions and you'll get some good answers back. That's what I say. Um, and he's also talked about, you know, he's not just interested in academia. He's actually interested in, you know, hearing from entrepreneurs as well. And I think that's a good, um, I think it's a good point. We should, we shouldn't just be another school, you know, uh, another sort of, yeah, standard school, let's say. Um, and he does like the idea of... Um, a small competition where maybe people are suggesting innovative ideas, you know, so he's more interested in the less, more, less of the research side of things and more of the entrepreneurial side of things. Actually, I think that's a really good point. When I say, should we do a biosensor school, let's say course, should I say a biosensor school for developers and entrepreneurs? That I think would, would then, you know, would sort of set the tone a bit more about, you know, especially because it's Zimmer and Peacock, you know, and that's, you know, and many of you think the same way as us. That's why we, you know, we do this. Celsuc also, um, also gave some ideas. Um, he did say, look, you know, we, it's good to have some pre-workshops before the main workshop. And he said three to seven days, which is um, useful to agree. He also says the winter school. So that's kind of cool. He was also saying about... Um, he was quite interested in like application specific webinars. I think that's actually quite interesting because the first one we could do is health and wellness. Um, you know, that's the one we know most about. But yeah, we can go into agriculture um, and environmental as well. So I think that's a good point to actually have a little um, theme each time. And online um, lectures as well as part of it. So I appreciate the feedback um, on that. So the last question was, um, and I just want to say that Ali, I'm oh sorry, not Ali, Aftab, who's a member of the ZP Developer Zone, I know that he's busy at the moment doing this as well. So I'll be very interested to hear um, his feedback in a few days' time. But a few weeks ago, one of our ZP Developer Zone members, um, we gave them a 100% discount for um, downloading this 3D printable file. It allows them to put our screen printed electrodes into the flow channel. And he wanted to know, is my current proportional to flow rate? And we did a whole um, series of slides on it. And I kind of came down to the answer is yes. Um, the flow rate, um, the signal is proportional to flow rate. I also had an interesting conversation with um, a gentleman called Jim Powers, who's been working with ZP for the, you know, for essentially for seven years. And he actually disagreed with me and I actually respect his opinion. Um, the reason you can disagree with me is because the equation I'm showing you is for the, it says that current is proportional to the concentration and mass transport if the electrode is bare. Of course, you know, it's not bare. It's a, it's a stack of polymers and enzymes here. So, you know, it's, it is more complicated than that. I think from experience, 
I have made glucose sensors on what's called rotating disc electrodes. The faster I spin them, the more current I get. So spinning is just another form of mass transport. So I do think my theory that signal is proportional to um, mass transport is correct. Um, you would ha literally have to make it and measure it to confirm it. But I, I would say I was 99% correct. Um, but I was asked where did I get that equation from? Now the quick answer is now I know I'm using the right equation because I did I did look it I did look up online a bit and I found this on the Cambridge University website. It's exactly the same equation. Just because Cambridge says it and I say it doesn't make it right, by the way. Um, but I'm pretty sure it's right. I got it from my first course in electroprocessors. Um, I have, I don't own this book anymore. Um, this was about 20 years ago that I read this, but the derivation for this equation comes from there. And the reason I sort of say that is because the, the inquirer is doing his PhD. So I know that he's got good access to the university library. So I'd say if you want to know where this essentially where this equation is or do some background reading, um, the first course in electroprocesses by a gentleman called Derek Pletcher. Um, I don't mind saying Derek was my supervisor. So that's um, I was learning this stuff when I was doing my PhD. So I hope that kind of and lets you. So you can put a little ch half a chapter in your book, have a read about, um, read this book, it's fairly digestible. So in summary, um, we did answer some questions this week about measuring sweat, um, and glucose in sweat. I think Ali, honestly, to get people going, measure pH in sweat. pH is such a more robust sensor than glucose. Um, I would, and especially because we have the hype, from Zimmer and Peacock, we have the hyper value pH sensor, so the cost is even less, let's say. Um, Selsuk asked some very interesting questions about temperature and the effects on sensors. Online, he did ask, can we do iron in river water? If you do iron in river water, um, I would, the equipment that you would need to do a proof of principle would be the sense it's smart because you can probably do um, absorption stripping voltammetry on that. And a hyper value carbon electrode from ZP might be quite good. But in the first instance, you might have to use a gold electrode because electroplating often takes better. It's probably is often better on gold rather than carbon. Um, brilliant feedback uh, from Hitchem and from Selsuk on the summer school. Oh, sorry, not summer school, I keep calling it summer school, from the biosensor school. Um, I really appreciate that feedback. And then for our friend doing his PhD, um, the first the book you want to get from the library to give and to give you a background on this is the first course in electroprocessors. All right, it's 8.23. I've actually got a meeting starting at 8.30, so I'm going to um, go quite quickly now. But I did want to say that... Um, oh, yeah, Saravan, cool. So, Saravan, thank you for joining. Ali, I see you there. Um, it's very much appreciated. Hanadi, um, thank you for joining this week. Like I say, Hanadi's got quite a strong background in CGM. Um, and I think she made a comment at some point. Glucose in sweat is not necessarily well co correlated with glucose in blood. So that clinical proof is probably lacking. Um, yeah, so I will wrap up. I do appreciate you all coming. Um, got any questions? Um, I know that Af um, Aftab's got had some questions. Post them in the forum and we will answer them. All right. Otherwise, um, thank you very much. And I will catch you all, some of you Sunday evening and next, some of you next Thursday. All right. Take care, guys.